We've got three speakers today who are going to be speaking for about 12 minutes each. Um, and then following it, we will have a space for audience Q&A. Um, so if you've got a question, please do direct it at the end to one of our speakers once everyone has finished speaking. So I'm going to start then with Professor David Feldman, Director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism at Birkbeck, University of London. And he's speaking on antisemitism on the left or left antisemitism. And he will be followed by antisemitism and the politics of attention by Dr. Keith Khan Harris, senior lecturer in contemporary Jewish communities at Leo Bayat College. And then third and finally, we'll have Professor Tony Kushner, Professor of the History of Jewish and Jewish Relations at the University of Southampton, speaking on why Jeremy Corbyn's best parents are at Cable Street, the strengths and limitations of left anti-racism. So we'll start then maybe with uh, Professor Feldman. Uh, thank you, George, and thank you, everyone, for, um, as it were, e-turning e up, and, and thank you to the Parks Institute for the invitation. Antisemitism on the left or left antisemitism? What's at stake in this question? It boils down to this, I think. In history and in the present, we are confronted by diverse antisemitisms from different political locations or religious locations, Christian, nationalist, fascist antisemitisms, but also antisemitism from the left. Are these best seen as variations on a single theme? Or is there something more particular about the content of left antisemitism, something special to the ways in which the left is hostile to the Jews? In addressing this, I'll talk about the UK and largely about Labour. And I will give two different answers, which depend on two different approaches to the question. One approach focuses on the content of left antisemitism. This concludes that um, antisemitism on the left is not distinctive. And I should say that some of the content in what I say about this, although not the specific analysis, is taken from work that I've undertaken with my colleagues, Brendan McGeever and Ben Gidley. The second approach focuses on what Jews and their friends mean when they call something anti-Semitic. And this approach leads to a different answer, namely that for many people, there is a distinctive left anti-Semitism. I will take as given that Labour has had a problem with anti-Semitism over the last few years. The proposition that anti-Semitic ideas are alive and well within left political culture is evidenced by research, by a great deal of research, not least that undertaken last year by Hope Not Hate, which identified 27,000 UK based left wing Twitter accounts that either directly spread anti Semitic ideas or deny or trivialize them. So, how should we conceive this anti Semitism on the left and in Labour? Here I want to make three points. First, we need to contextualize this by saying that in the UK as a whole, there are relatively few thoroughgoing ideological anti-Semites. Whether we look at, at, at the Pew Research Center surveys or the Jewish policy research surveys, this comes down to something like five to six percent of the adult population that have um, an ideological animus against Jews or multiple negative attitudes towards Jews. Secondly, anti-Semitic attitudes are much more widespread than this five or six percent. In surveys where people are offered a number of anti-Semitic statements, the numbers who will, who will assent to one or two of these, um, for example, that Jews get rich at the expense of others, or that Jews hold too much power or have interests which are very different uh, from non-Jews, the figure for this rises to 30% or higher. Thirdly, these diffuse anti-Semitic attitudes are as likely to be found among conservatives as Labour supporters. And we can see this from one more survey, um, in fact, from more than one survey, but most recently from the YouGov survey conducted in autumn of 2019. This found, for example, that 15% of conservative voters agreed that having a connection to Israel makes Jewish people less loyal to Britain than other British people. 
whereas the figure among Labour voters was 11%. On the other hand, Labour voters were more likely than Conservative voters to think that Jews have too much power in the media. Where does this lead us? Well, ideological thoroughgoing anti-Semitism is too small, in, it's too few a number, too small a percentage of the population to make it plausible that this is the underlying source of Labour's problem. And it doesn't fit with the contingent nature of most, although not all, of cases of anti-Semitism in Labour. With few exceptions, uh, and there are a few exceptions, anti-Semitic anti occurrences in Labour do not arise from people with a long record of Jew baiting. A significant minority of supporters of both main parties are sent to anti-Semitic stereotypes and prejudices. And this presents a puzzle. Why is anti-Semitism a problem for Labour? when conservative supporters are vulnerable to the same prejudices. The question we need to ask then is not whether there is anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but why the anti-Semitism in Labour has risen to the surface. And as we've seen, I think this doesn't happen because Labour members are more likely to be committed ideological anti-Semites. The reason I think can be found in the contingencies of political debate. Over the last few years, Jews have intersected or have been perceived to intersect with some of the key issues that Labour members care about, Israel and Palestine, and the operation of power within capitalist society. We see Labour members and supporters, or some Labour members and supporters, reaching for well-worn anti-Semitic anti -Semitic ideas, stereotypes and narratives that provide a simplistic and apparently to them persuasive account of these issues. In the case of anti-capitalism, for example, there is a long-standing tendency on the left to understand capitalism as a corrupt system shaped by the machinations of a self-serving elite rather than as a set of economic structures and relations. Labour's key slogan for the many, not the few, was appropriated by some members and supporters drawn to conspiratorial thinking who have drawn upon a pre-existing store of anti-Semitic attitudes in which Jews appear as the personification of finance capital and as the hidden hand pulling the levers of power. When political debate turns to Israel and to finance capitalism, diffuse anti-Semitic attitudes which exist latently as a resource within British political culture become active, Jews are racialized and abused in political debate. All this, I think, leads to a conclusion that there is nothing unique in anti-Semitism in Labour. The tropes, the images and narratives, the content of Labour anti-Semitism is not distinctive. The underlying ideas are equally spread across the political spectrum, as we can see in the attacks on Soros, on, on, on the alleged influence of George, um, of George Soros, or an idea that comes from the right, the far right, or another far right idea that the migration of Muslim refugees to Europe and the United States is um, is um, is being designed by Jews to undermine white American or European identity. In both cases, the idea that finance is Jewish or that Jews exert a covert and malign power. Um, is, is alive and well on the far right. So that lead, uh, leads one to talk about, I think, anti-Semitism on the left, not, not left anti-Semitism. But there is another way of looking at the issue. Namely, what happens if instead of looking at anti-Semitic discourse, we look at Jews and others when they label people or forms of speech or representation anti-Semitic? And here, I'm afraid I'm going to move from today into history just for a moment. Um, from the outset, when the charge, the specific charge of anti-Semitism was first made in, um, in, in the late 1870s, early 1880s, it was connected to a rights claim, a claim to rights on the part of Jews. In origin, this is because the first anti-Semitic organization, the League of Anti-Semites in Germany, was established with the aim of bringing into question 
the equal rights Jews had acquired as a result of emancipation in Germany. So in the early de last decades of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century, in Britain and in Western Europe, anti-Semitism, when Jews accused others of anti-Semitism, it was addressing the question of emancipation. To be an anti-Semite meant to be saying that Jews could not be patriots or citizens. And this is why, for example, in 1881-82, the pogroms in Russia were not labelled as anti-Semitic by anyone in the United Kingdom. It would not have made sense because Jews had no citizenship in Imperial Russia to be taken away from them. So the charge of anti-Semitism was from the start attached to a rights claim. Over 140 years, our idea of what anti-Semitism is has changed, partly, of course, due to changing forms of prejudice and persecution but also as norms about rights have changed over time. For example, in 1919, the minorities treaties after the First World War introduced the idea that Jews should have collective rights and anti-Semitism after that was invoked in new ways. More recently, ideas about equality has led us to, behave, has led us to label behavior as anti-Semitic, which previously was accepted as normal. For example, the existence of formal and informal quotas for Jews at private schools. In each case, the concept of anti-Semitism has been unintelligible without a set of rights, usually implicit, sometimes explicit, which anti-Semitism was taken to transgress. So, so um, there is today one set of rights claimed by many Jews in the name of all Jews, which parts of the left contest. Here is a tweet from the Campaign Against Antisemitism, which was issued on the 28th of June this year. And the tweet runs as follows. Zionism is the movement for the self-determination of Jews. The right to self-determination of peoples is universal and uh, uh, is universal. So-called anti-Zionism denies Jews that universal right and is therefore anti-Semitic. Now here is a rights claim which is contested from the left. It is contested in different ways. Some on the left are categorical anti-Zionists. Some question whether Israel should be defined as a Jewish state and not as a state of all its citizens. Some question whether Israel has the right to secure its future by exercising dominion or perhaps annexing land which it took control under, under which, of which it took control in the war of 1967. At it, sometimes leftist or labor uh, leftist or labor arguments which contest these rights use familiar anti-Semitic images and narratives, but not always, but or, or indeed not usually, I would say. But as the campaign against anti-Semitism tweet makes clear, in its view, that the designation of these leftist views as anti-Semitic does not depend on the appearance of these tropes, but on the denial of the Zionists' rights claim. And it is in this sense that we can talk of a specific problem, a specific, um, the existence of a specific anti-Semitism on the left. Many on the left, of course, would resist this description of themselves as anti-Semitic. I have my own views, of course, but my aim today is not to adjudicate in this argument, but to suggest that underlying the argument over whether there is a specific left anti-Semitism, what is often called the new anti-Semitism, is a still more fundamental debate over the rights to which Jews are legitimately the rights to which Jews are legitimately entitled in the world today. That's me done. OK, thank you very much. That's very fascinating. I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of questions. So um, if you do have a question, actually, please do write it in the text box. I will be reading it very thoroughly and I will gather them all and we'll return to your question at the end. Uh, now we're going to go to Dr. Keith Khan harris who's speaking on anti-Semitism and the politics of attention. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everybody can hear me OK. Um, wait one second. In this short talk, I'm interested less in anti-Semitism per se 
so much as its salience as an object of attention in political debate. What are the contributions that the social sciences can make to the study of politics is in distinguishing the everyday and unnoticed from the exceptional and discussed. Sociologists such as Evitar Zerubbabel, for example, have shown that uh, have shown how what we see as relevant or irrelevant and what is spoken about and not spoken about is socially constructed. So it is that we can distinguish those spaces and times in which anti-Semitic discourse is a taken for granted aspect of everyday life and those times and spaces where anti-Semitism is an object of discussion and or contestation. This distinction is not this simply a distinction between anti-Semitic and non-anti-Semitic. Within a political movement that seeks to persecute Jews, anti-Semitism may certainly be the focus of explicit attention, the focus of attempts to systematize its practice, to theorize and define the problems that Jews represent, and to establish the parameters of action against them. Conversely, within Jewish communities in some spaces and times where Jews had limited or no political agency, anti-Semitism may be treated as so inevitable that surviving and living with it is woven into the unnoticed fabric of everyday existence. Since the election of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour Party leader in September 2015, anti-Semitism has become an object of sustained attention in multiple spaces within the Labour Party itself. Part of the reason why so much attention has become focused on anti-Semitism is because at least some of those who have re reproduced anti-Semitic tropes and discourses did so contingently and instrumentally without sufficient awareness of what constitutes anti-Semitic discourse. In their important recent paper that David Feldman just referred to, Labour and Anti-Semitism, A Crisis Misunderstood, uh, David, together with Ben Gidley and Brendan McGee, speak of anti-Semitism as a reservoir of narratives and myths that can be taken as a resource in specific historical and social contexts. So it is that this reservoir was drawn on by some in the Labour Party as a weapon in factional battles, sometimes without awareness of the implications of doing so, and sometimes with awareness as well. Conversely, actions against, I'm sorry, my eyes are streaming. It's very inconvenient time. I'm really sorry, just give me one second. I'm not in tears, it's hay fever. <laughs> Conversely, actions against anti-Semitism in the party tried to make this reservoir the object of focused attention with varying degrees of success. The politics of attention on anti-Semitism is simultaneously closely connected to the politics of attention on Israel-Palestine and sometimes its mirror image. Often those Labour Party members and activists accused of drawing on anti-Semitic tropes responded, responded and do still respond by seeking to draw attention to what they see as the real issue, attempts to delegitimize criticism of Israel. Conversely, Jewish attempts to push back against anti-Semitism were often focused on refuting the salience of Israel-Palestine as the root cause of the issue. At a certain point though, certainly by 2019, it became difficult to apologize, to not pay attention to anti-Semitism in the Labour Party as it became a national political issue discussed and contested way beyond the boundaries of the party or the UK Jewish population. In this context, to draw from the anti-Semitism reservoir in taken for granted ways that did not attend to their contested meanings became an act of simultaneous knowing and unknowing, what I've called in a different context, reflexive anti-reflexivity. To attempt to turn anti-Semitic discourse back into everydayness is a political act against attention, an attempt to turn anti attention to other things. What I'm interested in doing now though, after this necessarily condensed and sweeping summary, is to consider what the politics of attention to anti-Semitism in the party and on the left more generally might mean now.
Now, of course, I'm not saying that the Labour Party anti-Semitism controversy has simply ended with the party's defeat in the December general election, Jeremy Corbyn's subsequent resignation and Keir Starmer's election as leader. Indeed, with the Equality and Human Rights Commission report apparently imminent and the pushback from some on the Labour left at what they consider attempts to purge or undermine them, the controversy is still ongoing. It may well become even more fierce, depending on Starmer's response to EHRC's judgment. Certainly, last week's controversy over Starmer's sacking of Rebecca Long Bailey from the Shadow Cabinet demonstrates the continuing potential of this issue to cause bitter conflict and to draw national attention. However, the wider context has certainly changed dramatically. For one thing, with the election probably for next election probably four and a half years away, the question of what the Labour Party is and should be has less urgency than it did in the years up until 2019, when an election was an imminent possibility and post-Brexit uh, turbulence. But more importantly, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown has radically transformed the politics of attention in the UK and worldwide. This is one of those rare issues whose impact is so dramatic and so widely shared that it inevitably dominates attention. And the economic fallout of the pandemic, even assuming that the UK is over the worst, which is very far from clear, will likely, persi will likely persist for years. The other issue that dominated attention is of course the Black Lives Matter protests and their subsequent global impact. The connections to the disruption that COVID-19 have wrought are not straightforward, but I think they do exist. At the very least, in a time of insecurity and vulnerability, racist violence and structural discrimination become even less tolerable than they might otherwise have been. A perceived sense that Trump, as well as other right-wing populist leaders, have responded to the pandemic callously or incompetently may also have led protests against racism to be a kind of proxy for wider frustrations. This extraordinary context raises questions about what drawing attention to the anti-Semitism issue in the Labour Party means not just today, but also before this year. When attention is drawn to anti-Semitism, what is being neglected? One of the most sensitive and disputed questions in the Labour Party controversy was whether attention was being sucked away from other forms of racism, both inside and outside the party. The Grenfell fire and the exposure of the Windrush scandal all took place during the period in which anti-Semitism became a national political issue. These racist incidents, together with the racism represented by police violence against people of colour, were very different in nature to anti-Semitism on the left. The racism directed against Jews from the left largely took the form of abuse, usually but not exclusive, exclusively verbal and online. The fears expressed by some Jews at the prospect of a Corbyn-led government sometimes derived from a fear that such a government would leave Jews unprotected from racist violence, particularly from his terrorism. While these fears may or may, or may not have been unfounded, they were by their very nature hypothetical. In contrast, attempts to draw attention to other forms of racism, particularly racism against people of colour, draw on current, actual existing examples of violence and structural discrimination, rather than on fears of what could be perpetrated by a future government. One of the ironies that I discuss in my book, Strange Hate, is that Jews and other minorities that have significant access to capital and influence, but do not by and large face structural discrimination, are better able to draw attention to racism against them than minorities who suffer from greater levels of discrimination and violence. In some sections of the left, this ability to fight racism with a degree of autonomy and agency can remove Jews from the list of minorities against whom racism is a significant concern. The corollary of this is that anti-racist activism is only required and possible if groups are so vulnerable they need outside support. Yet for all the disturbing implications of such assumptions, the ability of British Jews to fight racism outside of anti-racist coalitions can inevitably lead to battles for attention that ultimately weaken solidarity and a wider accounting with racism. That doesn't mean that Jews are always successful in drawing attention to, draw, in drawing attention to concerns. As they await the, await the judgment of the EH, 
EHRC re report, British Jews who are concerned about anti-Semitism and the Labour Party will have to consider how the politics of attention have changed since 2019. In some quarters, where wider anti-racist solidarity is more limited or non-existent, it is quite possible that there will be no accommodation with or sensitivity towards Black Lives Matter, leading to an adoption of similar rhetoric, aligning the difference between institutional racism within one institution with the institutional racism across multiple institutions. The Jewish labor movement, on the other hand, and other Jews who have sympathy with Black Lives Matter and who see themselves as part of wider anti-racist struggles will face a more difficult task. How to draw attention to what they view as the necessity for anti-racist institutional transformation within the Labour Party without drawing attention away from a much larger set of struggles. A politics of attention that allows for a fine grain distinction between types of struggle with varying degrees of significance is not easy to establish. One of the consequences of the online transformation of political discourse is that there has been a kind of leveling in which the only way to draw attention to an issue is to make the maximum amount of noise possible. Nonetheless, the task of establishing a more nuanced politics of attention remains essential. And those of us who write about or research anti-Semitism and Jews are not exempt from this task or from being part of the problem. The very act of having a speci speciality in a particular area can sometimes lead to implicit or explicit suggestions that what they write about is of particular importance. The practice of drawing attention, therefore, needs reflection across the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fleck. Keith. Very interesting talk. Um, it's going to generate questions. It's already generated a couple. Um, yep, keeping tabs on all of the questions. So now we're going to go to our third and final speaker, um, Professor Tony Kushner, who will be speaking on why some of Jeremy Corbyn's best parents are at Cable Street, the strengths and limitations of left anti-racism. OK, thank you very much. Um, I am just about to hopefully share the screen. Um, and just a, a very quick word about the slides, if we can get them to work here, uh, that they are quite male-centered uh, and uh, I think that reflects a, a, a wider discourse about the Battle of Cable Street itself. So I think what, what I'm going to be talking about tonight follows quite neatly from David and Keith's um, some, um, uh, papers. So some of my best relatives were at Cable Street. My older brother was resident at the Royal School for the Blind in the Liverpool suburb of Wavertree during the 1960s. Rather than join his mates in a regular weekend trip to see the Beatles, Mike preferred to stay in his dorm and listen to Radio Luxembourg. Mike must then be one of the few in Liverpool and beyond whose claim to fame is that he proudly did not go to the cavern. He proves that the rule that he remembers the 1960s and was thus not there. Go back three decades and any Stender or those of progressive politics were automatically there at Cable Street on 4th of October 1936, even allowing for the highest estimated of anti-fascist demonstrators, a maximum of 300,000 were present to make sure Oswald Mosley's black shirts would not pass, but no more than that. In 2000, I wrote an extended essay on writing and rewriting the Battle of Cable Street, which by, began by quoting Kenneth Leach, the radical East End clergyman, social reformer, and anti-racist campaigner. Leach argued that the Battle of Cable Street remains a myth in the strict sense of the term, an event of imaginative power, a source of inspiration, a symbolic conflict with which those involved in subsequent struggles could identify. Leach highlighted the, the power of this myth, uh, enabled, that it enabled distortions and even falsehoods to emerge, but equally, that it was a usable past of great significance, um, subject to contestation and constant reinterpretation. 
Leach wrote not long after the sustained and wide-ranging 50th anniversary of the battle, and it seemed in the years following 1986, uh, 1996, that its memory was 1986 that its memory was starting to fade, and a more self-consciously critical academic literature was, in contrast, begun beginning to gather momentum to unravel the various layers associated with it. In 2006 and 11, commemorations were more muted and the surviving veterans were fewer in number and their memories notably, noticeably less sharp. Yet as my piece Long May Its Memory Live, referencing a Communist Party speaker's admonition in, in 1942, the memory of the battle has gone in waves, neglect silence followed by intense engagement. For example, from 1939 to 41, for the Communist Party of Great Britain, perhaps the dominant force in the creation of the myth of Cable Street, it was not a usable past because of the Soviet Union's pact with Nazi Germany. In 1942, with the rediscovery of anti-fascism, it could be instrumentalized to gather support for the defense of Stalingrad. And just as it seemed that the Battle of Cable Street was in a period of terminal retreat, it has had a new lease of life in the past half decade. It confirms, if nothing else, my somewhat over-the-top claim 20 years ago that the 4th of October 1936 has become one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent, in an alternative chronology of Britain during the 20th century. Alas, even that alternative tag is in danger. Historic England, not known for its links to the Communist Party or the office of Jeremy Corbyn, has designated the site one of the country's top 20 places which brings to life England's rich history. And it is largely Jeremy Corbyn who has given fresh life and controversy to the battle, both nationally and even globally. In 2015, Corbyn referenced his mother Naomi having been present on the 4th of October 1936 in his bid to become Labour leader when accused of contacts with a Holocaust denier said, my mother stood in Cable Street alongside the Jewish people and the Irish people. A fuller narrative was provided a year later at the time of the 80th anniversary of Cable Street, where an impassioned Corbyn at the Cable Street mural highlighted the deep personal significance of the battle. One woman stood along with many others and she told me about it. That woman was my mother. She stood here with so many others because she wanted to live in a world, as we all do, that is free from xenophobia and free from hate. Those that stood here in 1936 did an enormous service. Undoubtedly, this family connection, however mythologized itself, has been utilized to show that the claim that Corbyn himself was anti-Semitic lacks foundation. This does not mean it, in a, it was in any way insincere. And as with his heartfelt obituary of the veteran local communist, Max Levitas in the Jewish Chronicle. The legendary uh, demonstration means much to him as a somewhat romantic symbol of people of different backgrounds coming together to fight racism and fascism. The snide comments of Times columnist Hugo Rifkind, did you know that Jeremy Corbyn's mother fought at the Battle of Cable Street, answering, I know it's a well-kept political secret, misses the significance of the event to Corbyn in the quest for cheap political point scoring. Indeed, Jeremy Corbyn does have a long and noble record of fighting racism and neo-Nazism. Yet whilst his work over three or more decades for refugees at both the constituency and parliamentary level literally knows no equal, there are limitations of his understanding of the nature of antisemitism, which is family narratives narrative has perhaps obscured to himself. Racial violence against Jews, Blacks and Asians and others is something he has consistently highlighted and he is equally at home attacking all forms of extreme right-wing activity and ideology. But Corbyn follows in the footsteps of many progressives in not acknowledging anti-Semitisms and racisms that exist within their own tradition. One thinks, for example, of the Cole's work on the profound racist and anti-Semite William Cobbett, and likewise E.P. Thompson, as highlighted by Paul Gilroy. In short, the world of culture and constructions of the Jews as somehow other and powerful, especially in relation to money and finance, are not com confronted. They become what Paul Gilroy calls strategic silences, strategic silences, 
referencing the, the absence of race in the work of Thompson Williams and other cultural theorists. Yet in spite of all the efforts of teams of researchers dedicated to the task, that the best that, the, the best that has been exposed in relation to Jeremy Corbyn was an off-the-cuff comment about Jews, who although having been in Britain for a long time, lack a sense of English irony. If Corbyn had some knowledge of the history of British humour, he would have realised that Jews pretty much invented irony, but let that go. What is significant is that perhaps Corbyn, in what was a difficult moment of a Palestinian speaker being treated without respect, showed perhaps some residue of his prep school, genteel rural background, which regarded the Jew as quite, not quite one of us. We can only speculate, but I suspect it is not something that Corbyn has subsequently reflected upon, and that I think uh, relates very neatly to Keith's paper. That it is the only example found suggests that the charge sheet is in this sense rather thin, and the weekly assertion made by the Jewish Chronicle that Corbyn is an anti-Semite and a racist could come out of Alice in Wonderland. It is also, however, a reflection that close to a half a century's historiography on the complex nature of British attitudes and responses to Jews and the key centrality of ambivalence has yet to impact on popular discourse. This complex approach of, of, of recent literature, um, not so recent anymore, runs counter to a culture that's only superficially engaged with the Holocaust and taken nothing out of it rather than the facile and dangerous slogan, never again. Dangerous in that all forms of hostility are judged and feared in the light of the Shoah. To conclude, the retelling of Naomi Corbyn's presence at the Battle of Cable Street has become yet one further example of how that epic day continues to inspire engagement from people of many different politics, generations and backgrounds. Returning to my title, Jeremy Corbyn's emphasis on this narrative is not a different version of some of my best friends are Jewish, therefore I can't be anti-Semitic. Rather, it reflects a lack of subtlety in his knowledge, thinking and self-reflection that explains his insensitivity and lack of awareness in confronting the anti-Semitism of others that is not a Mosleyite of a Mosleyite strain. Examples would include his preface to Hobson's Imperialism, featured in, uh, by Charlotte Riley in her talk yesterday, the mural in Tower Hamlets, uh, and sharing a platform with deniers and believers in the world Jewish conspiracy. In this, he is not alone in the progressive world. But finally, I want us to keep a sense of perspective, and we'll end with a figure who has been mentioned um, yesterday in, in our webinar, George Orwell. He was, a man, he was a man who did try, with partial and not substantial success, to confront his own prejudices towards Jews, especially in the Second World War. In 1945, Orwell wrote that antisemitism comes naturally to people of conservative tendency who suspect, who suspect Jews of weakening national morale and diluting the national culture. And for all the limitations, um, and complexities of, of, of survey week work uh, done in the last few years, I would suggest that recent research on anti-Semitism in Britain suggests that Orwell's analysis still generally holds true. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for that, Tony. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's gonna spark some really good questions. I can see in the, um, the chat to the right-hand side of my screen, there's already several questions here. So I think what I might do then is maybe start with perhaps maybe four or five, I'll direct them to a few, a few of our speakers. Um, and there are a couple of questions that are addressed to everyone, which I will make clear. Um, I think there are questions here that legitimately everyone would like to have uh, a discussion about. Um, so, I've got a question here from Joan Tumblety, and this is for everyone, uh, following on from a question from Joseph Finlay. And this is, what is meant by ideological anti-Semitism? That's in quotes. How might we see the problem differently if we dispense with that notion? And this follows on from a question, and this is for David, and it's from Joseph Finlay. And the question starts, David, in some of your work, along with that of others like Brian Schert and Diddy Herman, You've critiqued the term anti-Semitism as being too broad to be useful as a term of analysis. Should we be reaching for different language to describe various different forms of, and this is in quotes, anti-Semitism, close quotes, in the present? Um, 
And maybe I have a few more questions to start with then before returning to a general question. And this, these questions are for Keith. So this question is from Ros Edwards. Um, and it is indeed one that I think is directed to everyone as well. Um, the question is, is philosemitism seen as having any relationship to anti-racism? And another question, this is for Keith from Andrew Dean. Might there be something about the philosophical basis and assumptions of contemporary anti-racism that means that there might be an awkward fit between anti-racism struggles and opposing anti-Semitism? Would that help us to explain some of the splintering between left anti-racist struggles and opposing anti-Semitism? I can see there's a few more questions for everyone, but maybe at that point we'll stop. So there are four questions there and maybe allow anyone to have a go at those. So what a start and say the, the philo semitism question the argument that i make in my book from last year is that the, the, the problem uh of of anti-semitism in the labor party and on the left was precisely because of the coexistence of a certain kind of philo semitism with a certain kind of anti-semitism that is part of a, of a broader trend towards what I call selective anti-racisms, uh, where, where it is less common these days to dismiss entirely one particular group, but to accept some uh, and reject others. And this occurs on both left and right. So what I think, uh, following on from Tony's uh, presentation, one of the, the the functions that invocations of Cable Street for Corbyn and others on the left hold is it can be used as a kind of reproach reproach to contemporary Jews in the same way, it, basically to say, look at what you once were, and look at what you are now, in the sense that the Jews that are seen to have continued the Cable Street tradition, who are, who are seen as anti-Zionist, broadly neo-Bundist Jews are, are the Jews that are worth loving, whilst the Jews that embrace Zionism, which of course did exist at Cable Street, but that's another story, are, 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 are the ones that are, uh, that are, are the reproach to what Jew, Jewishness should be. So I think definitely philo-Semitism is, is intimately connected with what we're talking about here. Um, and and Dean's question there, which leads on to this, is the assumptions of contemporary anti-racism. I think there are two assumptions that you often find in contemporary anti-racist theory. One is, I, I think, an absolutely reasonable focus on structural discrimination uh, uh, and poverty and police oppression and that sort of stuff, which I think... Uh, it's awkward to fit Jews into today. And secondly, and I think this is more problematic, uh, a kind of assumption that there is one struggle, that the struggle against racism is an interconnected struggle. And that depends on a view of particular white supremacy as, as something that connects up various forms of racism worldwide. And I disagree with that. And I think that's a blind spot in two ways. First of all, I don't think that all anti-racist struggles are the same and that all racisms come down to the same meta-racism. Second of all, even if we could live in a world without white supremacy, we would not be living in a world without power and abuse and violence. One of the problems I think that with a lot of anti-racism is that it lacks a wider historical view of what particularly of what the world looked like before the rise of Western imperialism and the persistence of not exactly racism, but certainly the persistence of particular forms of oppression and discrimination and abuse that go across historical time uh, long before uh, the kind of white supremacy that we see today. So, so in, in other words, racism existed in, in some form before white supremacy and racism will exist in some form after white supremacy. So, yeah. Somebody else want to say something? <laughs> um, if I take up uh, Joseph's 
question about um, is anti-Semitism too broad? Um, I think my answer to that is perhaps less certain than it once uh, than it once would have been. Um, it does seem to me, uh, if I start off with the problems of the term, I mean, the term, um, particularly now, that uh, discussions of anti-Semitism very often focus on images, narratives, tropes. We've all become the users of this term trope, which half a dozen years, half a dozen years ago, we, um, um, only the sort of literature students amongst us would have uttered. Um, of course, many of these um, images, not all, uh, can be are often used by Jews themselves about themselves in a positive way. I mean, the association of Jews with money, for example, and this one. Uh, um, obvious example um, of the, of the Jewish Chronicle celebrating the sort of financial success of certain Jews, and, and there are many, many historical examples of this. So, the term anti-Semitism is it becomes difficult to use um, if anti-Semitism ultimately is seen to reside in a set of images. It's also a term which doesn't. Um, easily differentiate between attitudes and more institutional forms of uh, more institutional forms of prejudice. Uh, in fact, very often it, it doesn't can't really account for institutional forms of of um, of of a disadvantage. Um, but, but I think it, so I think the term needs to be questioned um but above all sort of questioned as it were inside of the academy i think it, it, it in the public world in, in the world of politics we're stuck with it and it is and as i try to explain in the last few minutes of my talk i think we're stuck with a, a situation in which what it means is it is um is contested in which there's uh, 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 there's fundamental disagreement um, uh, uh, over what it means, and there isn't really going to be any getting away from that in the foreseeable future. The only other thing that I just mention is the one of the interesting trends of the last few years has been the preference in the Jewish Chronicle and and, and one or two other places to replace anti-Semitism with the term Jew hate. And um, I'm not, and perhaps that might be one response to some of the, the difficulties uh, which I've mentioned. Um, but what, in its casual usage, the term anti Semitism does refer to is what um, Keith, when he kindly referred to the article I recently published along with Brendan and Ben, what we call the reservoir of anti-Semitism in, uh, in Western, uh, on the side of Western culture. And the term does, I think, usefully capture something there. I suppose I, I'm going to have a, a slightly alternative view, and I, I, I take a lot of what David was saying. And you know, I think one reason I've not really engaged very much over the last few years, I mean, my first work, uh, a few months ago, or was it 30 odd years, uh, was about, uh, was looking at British anti-Semitism. And I, I've sort of run away from trying to do such work again uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And I, and I think I've been sort of depressed with the crudity of so much of the, of the, of the, of the sort of popular uh, public discussion of anti-Semitism in the media and so on. And I suppose I, I, I would still be very critical of of the use of the term that I think it has, uh, we, we've got away from from the work which I think uh, all of us then younger scholars were trying to produce about ambivalence in culture and, and society as a whole towards Jews, differentiating Jews and constructing Jews as good or bad according to your perspective. Uh, so for example, uh, 
recent, very recent biography of Ernest Bevin um, concludes he was an anti-Semite. Well, you know, that doesn't help very much. Bevin's attitudes were complex. He supported Jews going to Palestine in very big numbers as the as the leader of the world's largest trade union in the late 1930s and helped thousands of Jews to escape through that route. Um, but when Jews didn't behave in the way he didn't like, then he, he would come up with all sorts of hostile images as Jews as urban and, and, um, uh, and un, uh, unproductive. And so you know, to call him an anti-Semite does not explain Bevin. And I think that's uh, true of, of so much discourse. Uh, and it, we're sort of putting it through a sort of pregnancy test. Uh, and I'm sure the medical world say, well, it's actually more complicated between being pregnant and not being pregnant. But in my crude understanding, you're one or the other. And you're either an anti-Semite, you're not. And, and once you've got to that level, I, I sort of despair in terms of, of what we're, where we've got to, so which is why you know, this is a very rare reinsertion to this. But I, just very, very briefly on the, which is why, again, that, that term philo-Semitism, I and many other scholars would just limit it to a particular attitude coming out of the 17th century of, of a Christian response to Jews, which saw them as special, different, in a way that uh, extreme anti-Semites would see Jews as, as special in a negative way, but not as real Jews. So the lesson, if you like, in, in the file of Semitism has nothing to teach you about anti-racism, other than to, to avoid making the minority group in any way special. Uh, can I jump in there and say that um, sure. obviously the term anti-Semitism is highly perfect to, take, uh, uh, to say the least. But we ha also have to consider how terms can be used for didactic means and how you uh, and, and how you deploy them. Personally, I find that actually de uh, uh, deconstructing the term anti-Semitism and pointing out that Jews are not Semites, don't see themselves as Semites, and the term was coined by an anti-Semite is useful uh, didactically, pedagogically, uh, in the same way that um, uh, the, the process of deconstructing race is a good entry into discussions of racism. The same also applies to phy philo-Semitism, whilst I understand, which is a term that I use a lot, and I'm aware of where the concept comes from, but again, it makes it, it has this, it has a kind of shock value that can be useful to draw your attention to certain things. When in, when in debates about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, I refer to Jeremy Corbyn as a file of Semite and say that is the problem. That has a use value, and I think that it, it, this is a, part of the tension here is is between the specificity of how terms are used in scholarly discourse amongst people who understand their genealogy and how how uh, terms are used uh, in everyday pragmatics, so to speak, so to speak. And my own personal view is that it's often better to leverage everyday uses of terms rather rather than uh, and play with them and subvert them rather than is to, to simply abandon them. Okay, so I've got a couple more questions I see. Oh, there's actually enough one. There's a third. If anyone wants to come back on any of that quickly, or maybe it's maybe post a few more questions. Um, these questions are for everyone as well. Uh, um, so this question is from Claire Lafol, a very general question for everyone, maybe beyond the scope of today's discussion, uh, asking for your views on, is there a British left anti-Semitism? that would be distinct from a French, German or American left anti-Semitism. How much does the nature of this left anti-Semitism depend on the ethnic religious composition of the broader population and the relationship of each country to other factors? Israel-Palestine tension, multiculturalism and the integration of minorities. And there's a second, another question here, this is from Ivor Gabba. To what extent would the Labour anti-Semitism issue have come to prominence without the affordances of social media? A third question, and this is from Max Monday, and this is again for everyone. Question for everyone. I've been depressed about the lack of space for a nuanced and good faith based discussion about anti-Semitism on the left. As someone who was an active part of Corbyn's 2015 leadership campaign, but who acknowledges anti-Semitism in Labour and among its supporters. I also found the Jewish Labour movement and Starmer's desire for quick action regarding Rebecca Long-Bailey's expulsion a crude and unhelpful tool 
which doesn't help people understand anti-Semitism on the left. What are your thoughts? Thank you. Um, because I think they're for everyone, maybe what I suggest is maybe we, everyone could have a go in the order that they're on the programme, each of those questions in turn, perhaps maybe, to generate a debate and discussion. Okay. Um, uh, in a way, um, perhaps uh, taking the first question, is there a British left anti-Semitism? Um, is also a way back to um, what uh, some of the issues which Tony raised just before. It, clearly, um, the politics of race and the politics of racism emerges in different countries in different in different ways, partly because of the intellectual and political traditions, partly because of the ethnic um, ethnic um, and racial composition of the countries. Um, so one only has to um, uh, think of the um, a different form that the legacy of enslavement took in the United States to this country to see the ways in which uh, in which racial politics and the politics of anti-Semitism develop in different ways. However, what one does see are some of the same images and uh, stereotypes being reproduced in both in both contexts. And I just like to just tack back to where I think that my position has sort of shifted a little bit from um, what it used to be is that I, I think that um, it was really working on an exhibition on Jews and money at the, at the Jewish Museum a couple of years ago, which really made me um, try to come to terms in some way with the longevity and ubiquity and the recurrence of certain images of Jews and that the term anti-Semitism, although used in all sorts of um, crude ways, uh, as Tony says, is as good a term as any with which to capture that, but to capture it as a, as a starting point and to understand precisely as Claire's question implies, those ideas, those images are going to be reproduced in different ways in different, uh, in different contexts across space and across time. Over social media, um, was there ever a world without social media? I mean, I, I really can't remember. Um, I mean, clearly, the I don't think it's it. I think what is clear is that social media affected the way in which the uh, uh, labour's crisis it developed. Um, it um, it it amplified uh, the crisis. I I suspect it's it's too much to say uh, that uh, there would have been none without it. Um, over Rebecca Long Bailey, um, I think what will whether or not Starmer was right uh, to um, uh, sack her, um, as far as I'm concerned, personally I don't have a problem with that. Um, what I take away from that is that. Um, Rebecca Long Bailey wrote in The Guardian that it was never her intention to cause hurt to Jewish people. And if after everything that's happened over the last five years, she was able to retweet that article uh, with its lie um, and not realize it would cause hurt to Jewish people, then there, is, uh, then there was something lacking there. Um, so I'd like I'd like to pick up on what what David said uh, about that. I, I thought one of the interesting things about the Rebecca Long Bailey incident um, was that it raises all sorts of issues about education and redemption. There was uh, I saw some tweets from Jews 
who are on the left, uh, not the JLM sort of left, uh, but also ones who, who, who sort of took anti-Semitism seriously, is that this was a missed opportunity. This was a teachable moment, and our opportunity had been missed in the rush to do something quickly. And there are questions here about how long uh, one can be taught and how um, before one has to be assumed to have the message. If there is a permanent process of teachable moments, then you have to ask certain questions about why they keep recurring. The other thing that was interesting about that is how, uh, and it was often the same people who were saying this should be a teachable moment, who were also much less willing to grant uh, to other people that possibility of redemption in the case of other racisms. And that often draws on assumptions about how some racisms can be accidental, whereas other racisms can be um, are the result of something much more in, ingrained and ineradicable. Um, which, of course, is it, it's actually an empirical question. The extent to which, and it's an individual question, the extent to which racism can be an accident and racism is a reflection of something deep is not something that one can know. In a, it has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. However, when we need to do politics, when we need to do social policy, we don't have the ability to do that case by case sort of work. We have to make assumptions about what people's words mean. And that is, by definition, a highly imperfect process. Uh, but the only way that is the only fair way to do it is to not make that distinction between those racisms that one feels indulgent about, that one is, takes a, a more indulgent. Uh, view of uh, 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 an assumption of, of good faith and those racisms where one doesn't make an assumption of good faith. It's not really, uh, 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 it's not really a practical and useful way of going about it. The other thing was, uh, uh, could the uh, labor anti-Semitism thing happen without social media? And on that, I just want to take it as a tangent. One of the most strike I, I, I came to the anti-Semitism issue. I'm not really interested in anti-Semitism. I'm interested in Jews. And I was interested in anti-Semitism in the Labour Party because of its impact on Jews. And one of the most striking things that has developed in the last few years is the growth of self-proclaimed implies pejorative. I don't mean it pejoratively. Self-proclaimed fighters against anti-Semitism and indeed against other racisms who are online, who see themselves as grassroots activists. And that has had, I think, quite a profound effect on the Jewish community. The ability to engage in anti-anti-Semitic activity on a self-directed uh, basis, which is not something uh, that we have had before. Uh, action against anti-Semitism prior to that uh, was very difficult to be a self it was very difficult to do it in a self-direct manner now one can do it in a self-directed manner and that leads to all sorts of implications about communal politics about how communities respond to racism um, and about the nature of anti-racist activism that i think we're only just beginning to sort of work through and even to recognize that they are there as to the one about cross-cultural differences, I think there absolutely are, uh, but I think that's a much bigger question that deserves its own seminar. Okay, uh, and to go to, to Claire's question, uh, you know, I think there is, there is a, in, in race thinking through the 19th century, uh, there is so much exchange of ideas and policies, we see it in immigration controls, uh, health measures against migrants, but also in, in ways of thinking. Uh, we see it in, in uh, racism across the world, the imp impact of South African ways of thinking uh, across the world. So we see that in anti-Semitism as well, of, of exchange of ideas uh, across national boundaries. But there is still a very, very powerful, important national traditions. And in the UK, 
post-1945, the Second World War acts in a very different way to any other country. Uh, and there is a sort of, there is a uniqueness there, the obsession with the war, which is, is uh, not going away, as we have found out over the last few months to our cost of how many lives have been lost by that false metaphor of fighting an enemy that isn't in Nazis. But, uh, uh, it, it, and there are traditions as well, which uh, we saw yesterday um, when we were talking about, when uh, Charlotte was talking about Hobson, and these are not unique to, to the British labour movement, but there are traditions uh, uh, which uh, are peculiar to, to particular countries. So within those national framework, uh, international frameworks, there are inevitably national differences. One thing I, I would say was going back, but not probably in a way that Keith would in terms of going back to the Jews, but also I think society as a whole, and it was a throwaway sentence in my paper, but I think a very important one that needs enormous amount of attention is that I do think that there is a generational confrontation with the Holocaust, uh, especially in the Jewish world, especially those of, of refugee origins and even those of East European origin, which is a very emotional one. It is based on very, very little knowledge and understanding, but it is very, very visceral. Uh, and I think if, uh, just to, to sort of finish my comments in relation to David's referencing of what was one of the most outstanding exhibitions I've seen in any museum, let alone the Jewish Museum, of that on money and, and the Jews, it was not funded. Uh, they could not get any funding for it because no Jewish backer wanted to be associated with it. And in, in part, that has led to the collapse of the Jewish Museum. Uh, and I think that is the world that British Jews are, on the official level, are constructing for themselves. And the Jewish Chronicle, I think, has been particularly at blame there uh, of a world of paranoia uh, and never againism, which is making it very, very uncomfortable uh, to have uh, a sort of at ease, to be at ease with the world. And I think it is something that the answer to that is, is of course, to, to confront anti-Semitism. My argument about anti-Semitism, having worked on it as a group of young scholars to sort of say it was there uh, against the general societal uh, re refusal to accept that. Uh, uh, and then to be sort of questioned by people, why aren't you at the forefront of sort of saying that there's a right of anti-Semitism, new anti-Semitism? And I suppose my rather mundane line is, well, there's nothing much is new. Uh, I don't think the level has risen particularly much. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a continuity. Uh, what has changed, I think, is, is both British Jewish and general society's response to it, uh, which is a remarkable one compared to, to even 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and I think that does merit a lot more attention of, of how Jews have responded to what they confront. And I think if you take a very, you know, I think thoughtful writer generally, but I think Jonathan Friedland's writing in The Guardian, a very prominent publicist, um, that he is very open about referencing his fear of another Holocaust uh, and never again. And I think that there has to be a responsibility for those in the public domain to sort of say, let's be very careful about that. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your questions. A really interesting discussion was really illuminating. And thanks also for addressing all of the questions so thoroughly to our speakers. Um, I do wonder, actually, maybe, does anyone want to kind of briefly come back on any of the comments raised maybe across the speakers, maybe, just to kind of sum up our discussion? Sorry, you're talking about us no? <laughs> or... or, or, or... Yeah, like maybe if there's anything like that's been kind of like come up in the last 10 to sort of 15 minutes or so that you'd maybe like to come back to very briefly. It was a very interesting discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lots of uh, lots of very positive comments about how illuminating illuminating is a, a positive a, a positive word that's being repeated. I, I um, suppose there's only yes. one thing that, that I think is, is probably, it's too big a discussion for now, that's why I didn't really engage with it, but I think it probably deserves more attention, is this difference between ideological anti-Semitism and the sort of more contingent form. But I think that deserves to be discussed much more deeply, because I think it's a fascinating question. But another time. Sure.
Okay. All right. Well, thank. I think we are running out of time. Uh, but thanks very much for all of that. Very, very interesting. And uh, thanks very much to all of our speakers uh, for very interesting papers. Thanks very much to all of the audience for your uh, your participation and great questions as well. Some really interesting stuff. Maybe some questions that are perhaps even too big, maybe to to answer at the moment. Great.